Please be seated. The record will show the presence of the jury, the defendant, and all counsel. Mr. Martinez, you may continue with your closing argument. The defendant had made her way to uh, Pasadena along with her will to kill Mr. Alexander uh, in the evening of June 3rd of 2008. And uh, she stopped at the Starbucks. And after stopping at the Starbucks for as part of the stop, she decided to fill up. And we know that she had the three gallons of gas, or the three gas cans at that point, based on the receipts that uh, are, are before you. And the reason that she had those gas cans filled is so that now she was prepared to make it all the way through Arizona without having to stop for gasoline. And she, on, te on her direct uh, testimony and also part of cross-examination indicated that, well, the car, for whatever reason, had a bad engine, uh, for lack of a better term. It kept using gas so much, trying to manipulate you into thinking that she stopped at a number of places and used all the gas in the gas can. But there are no records or, or any other corroborative evidence that indicates that she stopped anywhere here in the state of Arizona for gasoline. So her plan, if you will, was working well at that point. She wanted to kill him. There was no way that anybody would be able to say that she was even in the state of Arizona because the defense would have been, well, I would have had to have stopped for gas. And there was no indication anywhere, and there is no indi in indication anywhere that she stopped for gas in the state of Arizona. Another thing that she did as she came into the state of Arizona is she turned off her telephone. And this telephone that she... It, the cell phone that she had was turned off so that it could not be traced by law enforcement. So now not only do you have her in a vessel, an automobile that will not be traced to the state of Arizona, you also have her with a telephone that is turned off. She gave several reasons to different people as to why the telephone was turned off. One of them that she gave to uh, Ryan Burns was that somehow it had lost its charge and that she had lost the charger and somehow she'd been able to buy it at some store. That was her story and then she was able to charge the telephone so that she then was able to call him near, the, near Hoover Dam. Another story that she gave was that well, when she stopped on the side of the road and she was cleaning up for, at, from killing Mr. Alexander, she actually was able to go underneath the seat and find the charger. Either way, the net effect of that was that as she came into Arizona, there was no electronic trail of her being here, and there was no physical trail of her uh, coming through. And, it, and this was done for the purpose. She knew that she was coming to kill him. There, there is no other reason why you would turn off your telephone as you're coming through here, especially this woman who clearly loved to use her telephone, but for this particular trip, for this time when she's approaching, uh, Mesa, telephone is off. And it doesn't come on until sometime later near Hoover Dam, again indicating she was never in the Mesa area. And without the electronic trail, it would have been difficult for the police to find that out. So now you have her in a position where she can come to Arizona and no one's going to know. She's in a car that's white, not red, so the police are not going to stop her. And she shows up with a gun and a knife. And she shows up to see Mr. Alexander. And if you remember that one of the things that she told the police officer, she always, whenever it was not to her benefit, would say, well, no, I was lying then. As if somehow that's a fallback position. As if somehow that's something to be rewarded. That, oh, I lied. So because I have admitted that I lied, you should put that in the good column. Forgetting that she lied to start with. And she lied to cover up the killing. And so she indicated that to this officer in a telephone call, and by this officer I mean uh, Detective Esteban Flores, that she knew the code to his garage, 0187. And so she knew the code to the garage, and she indicated that that's how she came in. She didn't knock on the front door. She didn't go out through the back and peep through the, um, through the sliding glass doors like she'd done before. She actually walked in. There's no indication that Mr. Alexander came to the door. And this was sometime after 4 o'clock in the morning. And as she came in, one of the things that's telling about what happened is that she said, I came in and I stood by the door and I watched him. And I watched him for 30, 45 seconds. Who does that? 
Who comes in and stands there? Someone with some sort of stalking behavior in their past? Someone who's arriving there unannounced? Someone who is there to surprise Mr. Alexander? Mr. Alexander happens to be awake. He's got the dog Napoleon with him. And the dog barks. And there's this hello, how are you kind of thing. And at that point, she says that either she does bring her stuff in or she doesn't bring her stuff in. She may have brought her camera at that point. And we also know that she brought in her purse. And her purse is big enough for this toy 25, toy looking 25 caliber handgun. It's also big enough for a knife. She comes in and according to her, they go to sleep. There's no sexual activity between them at that point. If Mr. Alexander was this sexual fiend that she has attempted to portray, why didn't he just force himself on her there? And she said, well, at that point I told him that I was tired and that I did not want to have sex. So whenever she said no, Mr. Alexander abided by that. The only time that she ever indicated that, that no, she didn't want to have sex with him, he abided by that. And they went to sleep until the next day. The next day, they do engage in some sexual contact. And there's such a uh, stigma that the defendant has attempted to uh, attach to this particular encounter. In fact, she goes so far as to uh, speak with uh, Richard Samuel, Dr. Richard Samuel, and tell him about this, and tells him that she, these photographs were actually taken while she was straddling Mr. Alexander. Additionally, she talks about how Mr. Alexander has on his computer all these photographs of women's breasts. It just has to add all of this to make Mr. Alexander be something that he is not, or have this encounter be something that it isn't. He did not go to Wairika to seek her out. She drove here to the state of Arizona, to Mesa, to see him. Yes, he did have a camera, and yes, it was used, and thank God he had the camera, because that's the reason why we're standing here, because of the images captured on that camera. And so they engaged in this sexual contact. And there's this, again, this religious sort of overtone, somehow that she's holier than thou, that it was all of his and his request. It was all about him. It was nothing about her. And that he's somehow violative of the concepts or the precepts of the Mormon faith. Why is that important? It's important because she wants to manipulate you. She wants you to believe that Wow, he's such a bad guy. He's holding himself out to be a virgin. And somehow that's really, really bad. That when people date, or when people talk about their sexual uh, lives, they somehow don't want everybody to know everything that's going on. If you remember, Deanna Reed indicated that, yes, they had transgressed. They had engaged in sexual contact. But they went to see the bishop. They got whatever penance or whatever punishment or whatever happened but they never engaged in that con contact again. Somehow, the defendant wants to make it seem that Mr. Alexander kept constantly going. He was this individual who had lost his priesthood or had not, had or had not. And somehow that this encounter was a microcosm of their whole relationship. Well, if it is a microcosm of their whole relationship, then we have the willing partner sitting right here, somebody who enjoyed it just as much as he did. One hand or two hands, she enjoyed it as much as he did. There are no indications in those photographs other than from their experts who say, look at the face. You can tell by the face that she really doesn't want to be there. Really? Can you tell by a grimacing face whether that's pain or joy? Can you tell that by just looking at somebody's face, especially if we're talking about a sexual situation? You can't. But they come in and they want to tell you that because... They have a psychology degree or they have a master's degree. And they want to tell you that don't believe what you see in your eyes. Don't, don't use your common sense or the experiences that you have coming in here. Believe what we have to say. And by looking at those photographs, you can see that this was all about Mr. Alexander. And again, that's a, just a microcosmic 
view, if you will, of this whole relationship where she says, I really never wanted to do it, but it was all about him. And yet, if you look at the photographs, there's no indication there that she really didn't want to do it. She was enjoying it as much as he was. And so they engage in this conduct, these two Mormons. So stop pointing a finger at him and stop wagging it as if somehow being a Mormon precludes you from being human. If somehow that's something bad that he did it, because she's just as Mormon as he is. So if there is fingers, if there are fingers to be pointed, it should be pointed at the same at each other. And if one's conduct is bad, the other one is just as bad. But that's not what this case is about. And they want you to think that that's what this case is about, that this is about Mormonism and the fact that Mr. Alexander was engaging in sexual intercourse. What those photographs show was that she was there. And they show you the time that she was there sometime after 1 o'clock in the afternoon. They may say that the color of her hair there is blonde, but you've been able to see that and you know what the color of her hair is. You don't need anybody to tell you what the color of her hair is. And so you know that at about 1.30, they are consummating, if you will, their feelings for each other, at least on a physical level. No indication there of anything else other than perhaps Mr. Alexander has adopted what the defendant has provided for him, because you do see the KY bottle in some of those photographs. And you do know who introduced that into the relationship from the uh, May 10th, 2008 conversation where Mr. Alexander thanked her for introducing, introducing him to that. We don't know who brought that on that particular day, but it could be reasonably inferred, we're not saying that it happened, that she brought it. She's the one that introduced him to it. Perhaps he already had it there. Either way, that's symbolic, if you will, of her attentiveness to this sexual uh, relationship that they had. And so, later on in the afternoon, toward getting later, sometime after five, the defendant says, and it depends on what you listen, or what version you listen to, that at that point, Mr. Alexander wanted to show off his body, according to her. And he wanted her to take photographs of him. You've heard the tape of her conversation with Detective Flores. That was taken when uh, she was arrested up in Wairica. In it, she says that he really didn't want to, that he was reluctant, and that she talked him out of it. And they talk about his shaving and how she loved the way he shaved because it was old fashioned. And then she starts talking about how, yes, she is able to get him to get into the shower and take photographs of that. And it really is more of her idea than his. And the only reason that the state can say that it is really more idea than his is if you hearken back, think back to what Daryl Brewer told you. One of the things that he was asked on direct ex or cross-examination was when he was on the witness stand, were there ever any photographs that were taken of you by the defendant? And he said, yes, only on one occasion were there photographs taken of me. I didn't want them taken. I was in the shower when she started to snap the photographs. So if it's something that she did in the past, if it's something that she's comfortable doing, to then turn around and say, oh no, Mr. Alexander was the person that wanted me to do it, when as part of the same case, you have her saying that no, he did not want her to do it. But she then starts taking photographs, and according to her, very sexy. But at that point, the ill will was already there. She is armed with both a knife and a gun at that point. And she begins to take these photographs. And as she takes these photographs, even though she says they are of a Calvin Klein kind of quality, with the water coming down as if it was sort of a Pacific, a very quiet, bucolic kind of scene, that's not what's going on. She talked earlier about a knife, justifying how a knife would have been upstairs by saying that there was this 20-foot rope and that somehow she was tied up with that 20-foot rope to that bed. And it depends on who, you, who she's talking to as to whether or not she was tied on her ankles as well as her wrists. But you've taken a look at that sleigh bed. Where is she going to be tied up on that bed, making it up, trying to justify 
or trying to have a knife there for some other purpose. But if you take a look at that bed, and you've seen it, you know that she's making it up. Just making it up. If she's not making it up, then why has she told some of the experts that she was tied by her ankles or on the foot of the bed? Why does she tell somebody else that it was both her ankles and wrists? Why does she need to keep changing positions? Because she has a lot to remember. And with the truth, you ain't got nothing to remember. But she has a lot to remember. And it's a lot for her to keep straight, given, given that she's making all of this up. And so, we, given the facts as we know them, and the fact that there was no rope, because it would have required her to clean up in the bedroom, because that's where the rope was. And if she was all bloody, because we do know that the floor was all bloody, it was also very wet. It was either wet with water, which is white, or it was wet with blood, which is red, Mr. Alexander's blood. It would have required her to go into the rest of the bedroom and leave some trail of that. And there's nothing there. So it means there was no rope there, and there was no knife there for her to get. It means that she had both the knife and or at least the knife at the time of the attack. And so what happens then is that she's standing there, and then we have this photograph, exhibit 160. This is the last photograph of Mr. Alexander while he's still living and before anything bad has happened to him. Quite a legacy for him, isn't it? He's sitting there. Not only is he defenseless, he does not have a gun. He does not have a knife. He doesn't have any weapon whatsoever. Not only does he not have that, he doesn't have any clothing on. And as he sits there, he doesn't have any dignity either. She's taken that away from him. And if anybody is defenseless, in this case, it isn't the defendant. It's Travis Alexander. As he sits like that, in that shower, with his killer standing there dressed in pants, uh, presumably a top on, because there's no indication that she didn't have a top on, with this camera. And she starts snapping this. Part of the story of hers that you would have to believe is that this is also an inadvertent photograph, that this is also an accidental photograph. But take a look, if you will, at the acuity and the sharpness of this photograph. There's nothing accidental about this. Somebody held the photograph, or the camera, firmly. The defendant held it firmly as she pressed the button and took this photograph, the last live photograph of Mr. Alexander. And while she had that in that position where he is in the inferior position to her, he's down. She's standing up. She can approach him. And she can approach him as he's sitting there. And she did. No doubt about that. This is not a case of whether or not there was an attack here, whether or not it wasn't her. It's her. And it's him. And it's the man that she has just had sex with. And it's this individual that she has planned to kill all the way from May 28th of 2008, days, even though the premeditation statute only requires a certain period of time. It doesn't require days doesn't require planning, requires thinking. And so she's been thinking about it for a long time because she came very prepared. And before she even went in there, one of the other preparations that she took was to take the license plate off the car. So 
Now she's inside. Now she's got him like that. Can anybody think of how anything else could be so much older or without feeling for the person than to make objection and your argument. Approach. It is cold. It is thinking. It is premeditated. To go up to this individual, someone that she has planned to kill for days, someone which, with whom she has been intimate with, and then attack him. She has indicated to you that it was a shot to the head. But the evidence, the forensic evidence, speaks otherwise. And for you to believe her, and for you to believe that the shot was first, you will need to set aside everything that she's told you, for example, the gas cans, everything else that she has told you, including the fact that she lied to the police, including the fact that she lied to uh, the experts, <coughs> including the fact that she lied here. And then you have to say, even though she's lied all of these times, even though she's looked us in the face and lied to us, we're now going to believe her with regard to just this one particular aspect. That is not something that is available to you, I submit. And I submit that because of everything that she has said. And so she gets her knife. And she took that knife and stabbed him right in front here. The reason that, she, that we know that she did that is because Mr. Alexander has defensive wounds, and he has defensive wounds to his left and to his right hand. As she is stabbing him, he is alive, and he is cognizant of it, and she begins, he begins to grab at the knife. But unfortunately for Mr. Alexander, one of the knife wounds is to the heart. Doesn't mean he's going to die immediately. It means she's just going to die. And part of the dying process includes, because of the, it's the heart, blood coming from his mouth and blood coming out from the wounds. But he's not going to die immediately. He's going to take some time, minutes, to bleed out. But he is going to die. So in a sense, she has already killed him. He's dead. Well, you know that he gets up at some point. You know that he doesn't remain seated there. Because throughout the bathroom, or, or where there's the uh, mat, where there, there's the scale, all around the bathroom, everywhere, there's blood. And if there's blood everywhere, that means there is movement there. And it isn't the kind of movement that is the flopping of the fish kind of movement. It is movement, it is purposeful movement on the part of Mr. Alexander to save his life. And as this time is going by, again, premeditation does not take days. Premeditation does not take a plan. Premeditation just takes time. And it can be a shorter amount of time. The stab wound, for example, after the first stab wound, it could be that. And as he is in this position of dying, he then ambulates. And we know that she didn't carry him over to the, um, to the uh, sink. We know that he goes there by himself. And one of the things that you see there 
is this, 98. That's the sink. And that's the sink with his blood on it after he has been stabbed. The reason that you know that he has already been stabbed at this point is because of the patterns that you have on this particular photograph. Right here on the left, and remember the injuries to the hand. He had more stab wounds to the left hand than he did to the right hand. And one of the patterns that was described here was this smudge or this transfer. So that if he, and remember, he had more injuries to his hand. That's not something that she can, she can tell you he doesn't, but you've looked at the photograph. You don't need to believe that. You can believe the photograph. And he does have an injury, a slight injury to his right hand. But if he's standing here, this would be where his left hand is. And you can see that there's the smudge or the transfer as he moves that way, as he's falling, moving away, indicating movement. He's still alive, but he's bleeding. That red stuff there, it's blood. And you also have the drops here. And those are placed there by gravity. If this individual has blood in his mouth, and if you remember that uh, the medical examiner testified that if you do have an injury to the heart, that's one of the things that happens. And as he, it requires Mr. Alexander to be standing there with his left arm like this. And as he's doing that, you do know that this is what's happening to him. She is stabbing him in the back. That's exhibit number 192. That's a concentric area. Exhibit 193 also shows us that. And he's also being stabbed, as you saw, in the back of the head as he stands at that sink. Because he is standing at that sink, and he is bleeding, and the amount of blood that's at that sink is indicative of time. You just don't go over for a second and get those patterns. He stood there, which means that the defendant was there with a knife, stabbing him. The other pattern that you see there this on the mirror. If you remember, the blood spatter person indicated that, well, yes, that can happen from, for example, gunshot wounds, but it can also happen if somebody has blood in their mouth and they get hit in the back of the head. And that's called blood spatter, high velocity sp sp splatter. And what that means then is that Mr. Alexander was having some force applied to his head at the time that he was standing there. That's how you can know that Exhibit 193 occurred when he was standing there and the strikes to the head because the splatter that is on the mirror indicates movement, hitting him. And then he goes and flies into the mirror. But he's not dead. He's still standing there. This woman came to visit him, came prepared though. So he begins to go in a different direction. And we know that he begins to go down the hallway, but he's still standing. The reason that we know that he's still standing is if you take a look at Exhibit 133. That's a blood transfer. It's either an item with blood came by or the blood was already there. Well, the item with blood in this case was Mr. Alexander. And as he's going by, you can see he was still sort of standing. And in this rainbow, somewhat ironic, there is no good luck for him at the end of that rainbow. But you can see that it starts high. And it arcs down to the area where there's a larger amount of blood. 
He's stumbling now that way. But he's stumbling with somebody after him. He's trying to get away. He's trying to get away from her over there. And she may cry now. But the jury instructions have told you that sympathy is not to be considered in this particular case. No doubt that she did it. No doubt that he's trying to get away from her. And you can tell that by the art that is there. You can see that even clearer. Here, with regard to exhibit 132, that's the same view only showing the art there. Just for contrast, to show you that that was part of what was going on, if you take a look at the other side, the other wall, you can see that these are more at the bottom, indicative of a substance with blood either rubbing it there, or the blood already being there and an item going through there, as opposed to this arc that we see here. She chases him down. That's what she did. He's still alive. How many stab wounds has she already given him at that point? The ones to the back? Do we really need to count the number of stab wounds to get? Is there a, a requisite number to get through the portal of death? No, not really. There's enough here to get him there. He's already got the one to the chest, which is going to kill him. He's already got the ones to the back of the head. They're not fatal. And he's got the ones to his back. But they are accelerating his departure from Earth. Because the more he bleeds, the quicker he dies. He don't die immediately. And so, when he gets here to the end of his rainbow, gets there to the end. And when he gets there, that's what she does. This, this is exhibit number 205. Let's just throw it from ear to ear. There can be no doubt that he got there on his own volition, by his own movements, as he tried to get away from her. We know that because of the blood stain pattern. You know that because of Exhibit 130, which shows you. And remember, the rainbow is right above there. He goes down, he collapses there. She catches up to him and goes for the throat. And if you want to believe her that she doesn't remember anything, doesn't know anything that's going on, why then? Why then, if she really doesn't know what's going on and can't remember, why is she so directed at a place where she can certainly cause death? If she really didn't know what was going on, if it was just really passion, if it was just a heat of passion, then you wouldn't have a directed hit to somewhere that's going to kill. You would have dispersed all over the place. But when he goes down, there is a direct strike to his neck, which is an indication of somebody who is thinking, this person's not going to live. He may get away from me in the shower. He may get away from me all the way to the sink. And he may stumble his way down that hallway. But you know, I caught him. And now, rather than stabbing him anywhere else, right here. So it's a very well orchestrated kill. And it takes time. By time, when somebody takes time, people think, so she's now stabbed him in the die. Now he's tried to get away, went to the sink, and what's almost something to consider, another thing to consider while he's at the sink is that in front of the sink is a mirror. 
And as he's standing there, a mirror is reflective of what's going on behind him. And he has eyes. His eyes are still open at that point. He can see. He can see the defendant deliver the strikes to his back. And down he goes. And then he gets another cut to the neck. But she's not done with him yet. And again, the point here is, is that if this were a kid of passion, if this were a situation where somebody was just upset, it would be random all over the place. But this was a strike to kill right at the neck. And then, after she does that, one of the things that we know is that the shooting didn't take place there. The shooting took place near the sink where he had previously been standing. And so, one of the things that they wanted you to believe was that if this person is shot and hit through the head, could have been shot there at the sink, according to them, it's already bleeding and still continued on. But the knife wounds do have to be first. Of course, that would violate the laws of nature because he's bleeding so profusely there that the doctor, by necessity, would have had to have found lots of blood in the track of the bullet, and he didn't. So if he was standing at the sink, and he was shot at the sink after being stabbed, there would be lots of blood there, and the doctor did not find any there. So he clearly was shot after that, when the situation was such that his heart wasn't beating, a situation when the uh, heart wasn't pumping enough blood to get it there, Bottom line, he was dead at the time that he was shot in order to forensically get the result of no blood in the track of the bullet. So he falls there. And then we have more directed behavior. We have this, exhibit number 162. That's Mr. Alexander, that's blood. That's his foot, and that's her foot. And given the fact that we know that the bathroom is this way, that's her standing there. And what's important about that, if we look at this exhibit here, is that it looks like there's been a wildebeest migration near his head. Look at that. That's and what's important about that is that even though there is the stomping of the feet, just means she was over him, hovering him. How many times was she, was she stamping around or stomping around her to get that pattern? But what's even more important about that is that there's nothing in the bedroom, which means that this was directed behavior at him. She was cognizant of what was going on because if she would have been in this state that she wants you to think that she was in, then it would have been all over the bedroom if she'd have been in this hysterical state that she describes you, describes for you. That she would run out, run into the bedroom, except it's in pristine shape. So what she does then is she begins to drag him. And again, if we look at that one and then the exhibit 163, which is a bit later, you can see she's dragging him down the hallway. What that shows is an intent or an attempt to clean up. And as she's going by the sink again, you know that she does something else. What she does is this, exhibit 207. Shoots him in the head. There is no blood in that blood trap, which means the heart isn't pumping. And when the heart isn't pumping, he is dead. There is no other medical phenomenon or any other medical uh, indications that um, would uh, give any other indication. And if that's the case, then he's already dead. And then you have the casing from the 25 caliber handgun that you took during this staged burglary. And then you have the casing right there falling on top of the blood as she's dragging him back. Because by necessity, 
the body has to be there. And what, if you remember, there's a closet that is up here, the sink is to the left, and this is, and the sink is to the left, and this falls to the right. One of the things that we've talked about is that the shot is right here. If she is dragging him in this fashion, that way, and she's pulling him along here, that would mean that it would be this portion of the head that was exposed. Which, if you're pulling somebody down the hallway, that's the result that you get. The casing is expelled, and it lands on the blood that's already there. So that's when she delivers this shot to him, somebody that's already dead. So she's killed him three times over. Is that enough premeditation? Even though she's had all of this planning already, this was a very directed attack. And then she goes about the business of cleaning up. And one of the most interesting things about the cleanup that she did is that she, yes, she knows about cameras. She knows what to do with cameras, according to her. And one of the things that she knows how to do, what to do with them is delete photographs. And she's able to look at all of the photographs that are on this camera. Let's assume, for example, that they've already deleted the ones involving the set. This one right here, the, fur, the inadvertent photographs, Exhibit 162, for example, had to be deleted after he was dead. There's no way to get it. There is no time travel here because that's really what they want you to believe. After this happened, she located the camera. And he's not carrying the camera as he's trying to survive. He's, he couldn't care less about that camera as he's standing over the sink. So what does he do? He just tries to get away. So the camera getting there means that she is the person that was holding onto the camera and carried it to that location. Then, after she shoots him, she goes back, places him in the shower. At some point, either after shooting him at the, um, at the sink or after placing him in the shower, at some point, she's still thinking. Because remember how much she has planned before. I've got to get rid of this evidence. I've got to delete this. And what does she do? She deletes only certain images. It's not like all of the images are deleted. This shows somebody who is thinking, oh, I don't want to delete the one of this dog uh, or this other one. I'll delete this, the only ones that hurt me. And that is directed behavior by somebody who claims to have dissociative amnesia. Dissociative amnesia, you heard what the definition of that was. Or is it a fog? Even the San Franciscan fog, if, if, if such a thing existed, wouldn't be so cloudy to account for this kind of behavior. There is no fog that someone can tell you about that hasn't lifted to allow for this. And so she cleans that up. She has that and she cleans that up. The other thing that we know is that she takes the camera at some point from that area there. And again, what's important about that, yes, it's important where it was found, and yes, it's important that it was found in the washer, but what's actually more important to show that she was thinking is that there are, it are no steps leading from the bedroom down to the area where the uh, camera was found that are bloody in nature or red, which means that she was cleaning herself up. Because if you're going to be walking around there, you by necessity are going to get it in your socks because that's what she's wearing. She would have had to get it on her socks. And if she's in this horrific hysterical state, she would have ran down and thrown it down there. But what she did is she cleaned herself up first. The police did not, and you looked at all the stairs, did not find anything that showed that there was any activity other than up in the bedroom, which means she cleaned up. She took her socks off. 
and then maybe put her shoes on or maybe put different socks on. But definitely the, the item that she was wearing was taken off before that camera was taken downstairs and put in the washing machine. And it was put in the washing machine and put through a cycle. Oh, there's this big indication or this indication she could have taken it with her. So, what does that mean? It just means it's in an alternative. But she has done so much already. Other things that she has done, according to her, is there was this glass underneath the, uh, the uh, sink area. And that's the glass that's found on top of Mr. Alexander after she cleaned him up. After she cleaned him up in the shower. We don't know if the glass was an afterthought or if it was used to actually clean him. But actually shows that she went to the sink, approached his body, and dropped it on top of him. But she cleaned him up, wanted to wash away anything or any contact or anything that would show her being there. Again, we're told about what um, uh, DNA is and how it's left behind. But if somebody washes it away, it's just not going to be there. And that's another step that she took in staging this scene. She washed away all of her DNA from him. Could have turned on. We don't know if she turned on the shower. We don't know if she used the glass. But we do know that she cleaned up. And it isn't because she loved Mr. Alexander that she cleaned him up. Oh, it isn't that she wanted him to look good, even though he, with all due respect, he looked a little bit crunched up there. It wasn't that. The net effect of what she did is to destroy any of her DNA. She washed it off. That's what people do when they want things that, such as items off their hands, they wash out. And that's what she did. And then we don't know what was in the middle of the bathroom that was causing her concern. But we know that she focused in on the bathroom area as well as near the closet. Again, we don't know exactly what was there. Perhaps uh, that's where she dropped the knife and she needed to clean the knife there. Because we know that the knife was clean. We know that the knife was not left behind. So again, there's this directed behavior with regard to the knife. Had the knife been dripping blood, and remember, she had just stuck it into his neck. Had that been happening, and had she been in this hysterical sort of mood that, that she wants you to believe, it's fair to say that that knife, knife would have been bloody, would have bled, she would have dropped blood along the way. No, she carried it out. She wants you to believe that she may have carried it down to the dishwasher. If she did carry it down to the dishwasher, which the state disputes, but we can use that for demonstrative purposes to show that knife, if it was carried downstairs, either had to be cleaned up upstairs or wrapped in something like a towel, which shows again directed behavior so that no blood got on any of the stairs, didn't get anywhere else. So if she says, which is what she said that sort of alluded to, that maybe that's what she did with the knife because no knife was found up there and we do know that a knife was, was used in this attack. If she did that, she, cleaned, she did something with the knife. She either cleaned it, stuck it in her purse, or according to her, even if you put it in the dishwasher, but she can't be sure about that, the behavior before the movement of the knife shows that she was thinking this whole thing through. Step back and you say, what has she, was she thinking at the time? Well, she was thinking of staging the scene, cleaning it. That's what she was doing. She cleaned the body of any DNA. She cleaned the area where it appears some of the attack occurred. The other implement, the knife, that was clean because it wasn't found or dripping anywhere. The, um, the gun, well, it was taken. The clothing that she had on her, specifically the footwear that you see in Exhibit 162, that wasn't found anywhere. There was no bloody socks anywhere. And even the towels that were upstairs, if you remember there was one towel missing from the set, was taken down and placed inside of the washing machine and the cycle was run. It appears that the cycle was run with Clorox. And what's significant about that is that Yes, it's significant that Clorox was used, but what's also significant about it is that the hands were clean at the time the Clorox was grabbed, because otherwise you would have seen the handle with blood on it, you would have seen blood all over the uh, washer. You didn't see that. 
she had already cleaned up upstairs. And she was cleaning up because she did not want to get caught. And it was actually, as, as plans go, pretty good except for the photographs. Well, she's now staged the scene. She's now cleaned up. There has been days of premeditation, but if you just take the scene itself, and we will discuss the jury instruction that tells you that it just requires a space of time. And killing somebody three times over has built into it a space of time, irrespective of which events you think happened first or happened last. It's the state's position that the, state, the stabbing happened first because of the forensic evidence and the blood spatter evidence that's upstairs. Either way, she killed him three times over. She stabbed him in the heart. He would die from that. Certainly the throat was immediately fatal, and the gunshot would also have been, immediate, would have been fatal. So there is this premeditation aspect. And so she staged the scene at that point. Then she did some other things that were equally as interesting. And by interesting, I mean demonstrative of how well she was thinking at the time. She claims that she was in this sort of foggy state. She wasn't in such a foggy state that she couldn't put the license plate back on the car that she was driving on the back. She was in a hurry and put it on upside down, but she did, had already taken it off before and remembered to put it back on such that she drove all the way to Utah that way and was stopped in West Jordan, uh, West Jordan uh, Utah. So yeah, she was thinking there. She wasn't, she wasn't driving without a license plate because police officers would have stopped you quicker without a license plate than one upside down. So thinking there. The other thing is she packed up the clothing that she was wearing. It was bloody. The, shoe, the, the socks included. Packed all of that up and took, her, took them with her. Cameras, her purse, the, the gun, all of that. She was cleaning it up, staging it up for the police. So that the, when the police went up there, they wouldn't even know what was going on. Got in the car, did all the cleaning, and was sure and careful not to get it anywhere other than the bathroom. Locked out. And then on that hot summer June 4th, got into the car, left Napoleon behind, and started to drive away after putting the license plate on the car. And, according to her, at some point, filling up with gas from the gas can. If you're in such a fog, how can you even remember that you have gas cans? How can you possibly even remember that you have a gas can if you've never done it before? And she, according to her, this is not something that she did on a usual basis. Overruled the jury is directed to recall the evidence. And away she goes down the road until, according to her, she stops on the side of the road, starts calling Ryan, and continues her lies. Starts calling Ryan and saying, and gave a story about where she had been. She lied to him. She wanted to continue that, speaking with him because he could potentially say, well, no, she was with me. She, she was somebody that was with me at the time. So again, she's continuing to stage the scene for the police. What else does she do? If she didn't think that she had killed him, then why is it that she's calling and leaving a voicemail message as soon as she possibly can? Oh, I'm sorry, I couldn't stop. If she was really in this state of fogginess, she could have, you would have heard some mumbling, or you would, she wouldn't have been able to work the prompts on the phone. But she was able, according to her, keep going back and try to uh, do the message. One, two, three, four. How many times did she say? Many, many times. She said she tried to do that. That shows some clarity of thought. And of course, though, she wants you to believe that there was no clarity of thought. She wants to manipulate you, wants to continue to lie. Why send an email? If you really didn't know what had happened, why send an email? Why not call the police? And why continue on your journey to make it seem normal? Why continue to make it seem normal? As if nothing had happened. The reason that you do that is because you had it planned. Ryan Burns was nothing more than her alibi. She should, maybe he was a little bit more because of the interest that she showed. But she calls him up, makes up this story about where the cell phone has been, and continues on to Utah into his waiting arms. Gosh, you could almost hear the violins making their sound. As she goes up to him, gives him that first kiss. Isn't that romantic? And then later on, as they kiss passionately after going out, and she 
adjusts him, whatever that may mean. Although, according to her, he's full of crap. Anybody that doesn't agree with her, oh, they're full of crap. That, those are her words from the witness stand. He's wrong. And a, he's, he's, he's not telling the truth according to her. He doesn't have anything to gain. But he does tell you that, yes, they were involved. And they were involved in a sexual fashion when she gets up there. What a wonderful reunion, what a wonderful time it must have been for her. And so then, there's this talk that she has with her friend Leslie Udy. And she begins to talk about the future with Mr. Alexander in it. How this Mr. Alexander that is going to be with her in the future, after he's married and he has kids, she's married, she has kids, the children are going to play together absolutely staging the scene again, continually staging the scene so that if the police start making inquiries, guess what? Well, she didn't know he was dead. Boy, she was just normal with me, Mr. Burns would say. And with Leslie Yudi, oh, she was talking about the future. Again, she's just staging the scene after what she has done. At the restaurant that they go to, there's this talk about her hands, and she, again, makes up a story as to how she got the injury to her hand, even though it's from the knife slipping as she was knifing Mr. Alexander to death. And then afterwards, her friend, Dan Freeman, calling her on the, on the, on the telephone and telling her, oh, his body has been found. And she crying and calls the bishop, trying to determine whether or not he was alive. What an absolute facade. She's creating a wall of excuses, a wall of absolute, what appears to be impenetrable might, so that no one can assail her. No one can say that she had anything to do with this, because she's acting the part. And she's lying. She's making it all up. She has lied to everybody. And she has staged the scene. She staged the scene of the murder. And then she came into court and during these proceedings staged her defense. And she staged her defense by lies. And the lies that she told were to a number of people and to uh, various groups of people. First of all, let's start with you. Perhaps it may be that in court, because of the admonition and standing in front of, of the clerk, that somehow that would bring out the truth. Because after all, this is a truth-finding sort of proceeding. Well, let's start with some of the examples that we can talk about that we know that she lied to you about. This issue about the gas cans. Absolutely, without a shadow of a doubt, she's a liar. And she's a liar about, number one, that she returned it to Walmart. And she's a liar about the fact that she didn't have them with her in Salt Lake City. It's just a lie. And the reason she's lying is that that explains why there are no receipts here in Arizona. And that also goes to premeditation. She planned to come and kill Mr. Alexander with that 25 caliber and that night from May 28th on. That's what the evidence shows. One of the things that you can say to yourself, well, you don't have any direct evidence of that. That's true. We have circumstantial evidence. And circumstantial evidence is a fact that you can deduce from looking at the circumstances as opposed to uh, direct evidence, which is visual or hearing, kind of sensory kind of um, evidence. The best example that I can give you about the difference between direct and circumstantial evidence and how it applies in this particular case is that if you are at a beach, it doesn't matter what beach it is, it doesn't matter what time of year it is, and you're there by yourself, and you're standing there and you're watching the waves come in. As you stand there from your left, somebody walks by and then goes to your right. A minute or so later, somebody else comes to you and says, has there anybody else been on this beach? And you can say, sure, I just saw him walk by. That's direct evidence. Well, contrast that with circumstantial evidence. You are at the same beach. You have not seen anybody go by. You have not seen any fingerprints. You haven't seen anything. And you decide that it's a nice day and you're going to close your eyes. You have your Wayfarer sunglasses on. You have your towel out. You're going to lay down. And you close your eyes for exactly, let's say, a minute. And before you closed your eyes, you noticed that there were no footprints here, no footprints in front of you, and no footprints there, and doesn't, the ocean's not coming up to you. Close your eyes, and you wake up, 
and when you, for those 45 seconds or so, and then you look, and to your left is a set of human footprints. You see it goes right in front of you, and then it goes by. You didn't hear anything, you didn't see anything. Somebody else comes up to you, or the same person comes up to you and says, has there been anybody here at the beach? You didn't see anybody, and you didn't hear anybody, but you can say yes. And the reason that you can say yes is because of the footprints that you saw after you woke up. And the same thing here. There are many footprints to this premeditation aspect. One of the footprints that we have is up in Wairika, California, after the May 26th, uh, 2008 argument where he tells her, you're the worst thing that ever happened to me. Then you have her stealing the gun, or the gun is stolen, and it's a 25 caliber that's actually found at the scene. After that, you have her borrowing some gas cans, and then you have her lying about those gas cans. And then you have her lying about the license plate. And you have her turning off her phone so that she can't be found in Arizona. And then you have the photographs and you have the rest of the evidence in this case. She premeditated the murder in this case. The other thing that uh, we need to talk about in terms of what she told you that is not true is why she rented the car in Reading. She said oh, that's the place that Priceline would give her the best deal. But you saw the receipts, not the receipts, but the statement from Washington Mutual that indicated that, hey, she paid directly to budget. Well, that wasn't a price like thing. She looked at each and every one of you, and that's what she told you. Well, that's because, of course, she's innocent, and you as a jury are not going to convict her, right? The other thing that um, she talked to you about was this... Uh, injury to her finger. She said that she showed you the finger and she demonstrated it to you. And she said that Mr. Alexander had been the person that actually had done that to her. Well, if you remember during cross-examination when she was being asked about what happened in, the, uh, in her killing of Mr. Alexander, uh, the question was, well, you really didn't get any injuries. I mean, uh, aside from the injury to the head, do you remember? That's all that you got then. And then she said, oh no, uh-uh. I also got the injury to my finger. Do you remember her saying that? In a moment of candor, in a moment when she wasn't quite expecting it, she said, yes, that's when it happened. Yet then she turns around and says later, no, 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 no. That's not how I got it. I got it working for Casa Ramos, Margaritaville. I got it at his house. Who knows? But she looked at you straight in the face about an event that occurred at the time of the killing. And she looked you in the face, every single one of you, after taking the oath and lied to you. Maybe, maybe this law of attraction, maybe something else, maybe that will explain it. Or maybe her experts will explain these three areas that you know were, were made up. She just made them up to you. And why did she make them up? Because although she says no jury will convict her, it's because she's attempting to get you or manipulating you to get to that particular point. One of the other things that perhaps we need to look at or talk about is uh, their experts. And with regard to their experts, and with regard to the defense that's presented, one of the things that perhaps you can sort of allude to and maybe make reference to when you're looking at this particular defense is by reference to Elizabeth Barrett Browning in a sonnet where she indicated that, and again, it's just a reference to it, how do I love thee, let me count the lies. It's a little bit of a reference to it, but that's not exactly what she said, but really, let me, how do I love thee, let me count the lies. Well, we've counted three so far that in this court, looking at each of you. She said, what else can we look at? Well, perhaps we can look at the motivation, or perhaps we can look at people that have testified on her behalf, and maybe we can understand what's going on. We can talk, for example, about Alice Laviolette. She's the person who has a master's, who came in and has been doing this for a long time. And one of the things that Alice Laviolette has, and she has an extensive uh, CV or resume, is one of the things she hasn't included in there is that she is also a liar. That is just the bottom line. She came in here and she told you 
in response to one of your questions about whether or not she had ever testified on behalf of a male in court. And she said one or two times. Remember that? And when she was pressed by the prosecutor during cross-examination, well, who are they? Uh, couldn't give me the name. Give me a name. Go ahead, give me a name. Uh, pressed even further, she said, well, I didn't testify. I actually wrote a report. She wanted to make herself more than she really was. She also talked about being a keynote speaker at one of the conferences where was Snow White a battered woman. She indicated that she was one of the keynote speakers there at one of those conferences, and she wasn't. Her CV indicated that she was on the plenary panel, which is just part of people that go there, and she made a presentation to a smaller group. And just as importantly with regard to lying and Alice LaViolette, she indicated and tried to justify the defendant's lies for you so that you wouldn't think that they were so bad. She kept saying, well, she lied before, but not afterwards. And we got into this conversation about lying, and Alice LaViolette said, well, you know, there are such things as white lies. Those are okay. See, you don't understand. For her and for the defendant, white lies. White lies, they're okay. And if it's to her benefit to say that something is a white lie, she will say that it is a white lie. And in this case, everything that's negative towards the defendant, and it is untruthful, well, that's just a white lie, according to Alice LaViolette. And to her, that's okay. Probably it's okay to Alice LaViolette because she herself wasn't truthful to you. It's one thing to be mistaken in a report. It's another thing to look at you as an expert because they're trying to provide guidance and say, mm, yes, I have testified on behalf of men before, and then going back and saying, no, that's not true. Measure, but maybe that's a guide to the defendant. Maybe that's something that she, of course, believes uh, Maybe that's something that buttresses the defendant's case, and Alice LaViolette believes that that's something that she should do. But what that indicates is that she's nothing more than an advocate. When you begin lying on behalf of the person that you evaluated, when you begin to uh, visit them, when you begin to uh, have, give them books, when you're with them for 44 hours, that line was crossed. Anything Alice LaViolette said is contaminated. It is foul. It is not something that you should consider. Because how much credibility can you give her if she came up here and in advocating that position, she lied to you? Absolutely no worth at all. And then you have Dr. Richard Samuels. And one of the things about uh, this Dr. Samuels was that, in the, in the issue involving lying, is one of the things that uh, he did is that he had trouble with regard to this scoring and rescoring. And there were some issues as to really what the motivation was for the rescoring. Uh, Janine DeMarte, Dr. Janine DeMarte indicated that, well, there's no reason to be rescoring something three times unless you perhaps want to change the scores. Or with regard to the MCMI, there's no reason to submit it twice unless perhaps you might want to change the scores. But one of the things that we do know about Dr. Samuels is that he gave the PDS test. And there is no doubt as to that test that the defendant lied. The defendant made it up. There is no uh, truth to the fact that on question 14, number four, that whatever seminal event that they're talking about, there was never indication, any indication whatsoever that there was a guy and a girl that came in and killed Mr. Alexander. But he based his test on that. And the defense and the questions may be asked about whether or not it involved the attack of a tiger, or if it involved the attack of a bear, or if it involved a gopher. Or, it doesn't matter. The bottom line is that it's a lie. Let's say that somebody goes to the doctor, and they go to the doctor, and they're talking about some sort of pain that they have. And if they start lying about the pain, isn't the treatment going to be affected by it? How good is the workup going to be if the seminal event that you're there for is a lie? Oh, yeah, you can say she suffered trauma. Okay. Let's assume that you even go that far and say the uh, PDS does show that she suffered trauma. Well, 
Which trauma are we talking about? Is it the bear? Is it the tiger? Is it the gopher? Or, in our case, is it the trauma of lying about killing Mr. Alexander? Is that what we're talking about? Or is it the killing of Mr. Alexander that we're talking about? Or, as the other expert, Cheryl Karp, found, was it the trauma of this non-existent domestic violence? The problem is, is that when you start lying and the experts get involved and they start basing their test on a lie, how valid do, can the results be? For example, Cheryl Karp found that, yes, she believed it was post-traumatic stress disorder based on many, many events of domestic violence. Yet there are only four that were presented to you and never linked to post-traumatic stress disorder. Then there's this test of PDS that was, that was taken and according to Dr. Samuels, he said, you know what, I probably should have re-administered it. In a moment of candor, he said that. And yet he then reversed his position and changed it. But again, what do we have here? Another lie by the defendant. Not only to Dr. Samuels, but also to Dr. Karp or Janine DeMarte. Dr. Janine DeMarte. Either one. You can't have a lot of domestic violence or a little bit of domestic violence. So you have that issue that uh, is sort of floating out there with regard to the experts. The other area that the defendant lied about was, or to, was the police. Uh, Detective Sir, Ford? Oh. All right, ladies and gentlemen, 15 minutes. Please be back at 3 o'clock. 15 minutes. You are excused. Please remember the admonition. We are in recess.